my newest Legends collectible here. Mr. Man of a Thousand Bookshelves behind me. <laughs> I'm going to show off. Uh, here's the dilemma, all right? When it comes to these Funko Pops, when it comes to these Funkos, they, um, they're pretty collectible. And especially the highly sought-after ones, the issue is... You know, they're, um, they're getting snatched up pretty quickly. I'm trying not to point fingers at, like, scalpers. But let's be honest. There's some people on the internet who are, you know, it's a wretched hive of scum and villainy out there, people. <laughs> um, and so, of course, sure. what happened is I was able to get Malik, but was unable to get Revan as a pre-order from GameStop. So what I had to do is I had to pre-order Revan through a less than reputable less than reputable eBay seller who took a month to get it to me after uh, I had ordered it, you know, paid the markup. It wasn't egregious or anything, but, uh, you know, it was still more than the $12 that a Funko should be. Yeah. And all of that is to say, after sending him a message and him being, well, kind of difficult, if we're being honest, finally, after all this time, reunited, uh-huh. we've got Revan and Malik in all their Funko glory. He looks even better on camera than he does in real life. I can get him centered here. We've got Revan and Malik, friends to enemies, to, now probably not the levers, but at least friends to enemies. Uh, so there's all of that. <laughs> um, I've got to say out of all of my Legends Funkos, not Legends Funkos, out of all my Legends collectibles, all right, people are about to hear me come unhinged if we don't get Freddy back here. Um, <laughs> out of all my Legends collectibles that, that are not books, I think that Revan might be, you know, might be top 10. What do you think? Uh, you think, Jake, that that would be like a good estimation out of, uh, you know, where you rank your Legends collectibles? If you had a Revan Funko, would, don't you think it would have to be in a top 10? Oh, yeah. I don't, because see, for me, where I came into Legends so late, and like, there was so, like, what I did know and kind of understood about all of them, because I, like, with Knights of the Old Republic and things like that, that was all, I didn't play that game. But I knew who this character was and all those kinds of things. And it's like, as they've even started to kind of push some of the Black Series figures out, you know, I've looked at it and I'm just like, I need, because I like to have the figures with the books. So like, even though I have those books and everything, and it's like, you got the, the can and non-can and stuff, like you got to have them in there. And, uh, and that's what, I mean, you know, it, it, I'd probably say, because Thrawn's can and now, I mean, is Revan just the most favorite Legends character at this point? If I can period. click on the right freaking scene. Freddy, <laughs> what have you done to me, man? Yeah, I'm just going to leave you upside down for the rest of the show, Freddy. I'm going to leave you upside down. That's how frustrated I am with, <laughs> with this opening. From the there side. There we go. There we go. From the top. All right. Freddy, did you even see my Revan collectible? I did. I did. I saw everything. I've been, I've been holding on to him for two weeks to show this to you because we didn't have a show last week. I was so excited to show it to you. And then you're not even here with me. But you're looking good now, Freddy. <laughs> Everything's coming through nice and clean. And now that I've jinxed it, let's you know, go. I want to let Freddy. everyone know at the very beginning of this show, Jared was like, oh, you know what? Everything <laughs> oh, this is my fault. Huh? Out. <laughs> this is my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think Jared and I were on here at like 8, 8.30, 8.15. Yeah, that's maybe. right. Yeah, that's right. Like, yeah, to be totally honest with everybody, we're dealing with – Pretty drastic time zone differences. You know, Freddie being all the way on the West Coast, me being all, all the way on the East Coast. and uh, I'm if, East Coast. All right. If, if, so that made it easier for both of us to... Uh, to but it's not even like together. they're back to back. We got to go those... like full coast to coast. Oh, yeah, absolutely coast to coast. Thank you for those bits. Andrew, thanks for hanging out with us for a bit. I had to catch the show at a later date. We, of course, got off to a late start. Took us a while to get everything going. But you know what? We've got a fun show planned because we are talking about what might just be the very best Legends book. I don't know. I have to hear your opinion on it. For me, I'm going to say it might be. It might be, depending on my mood, which right now is pretty unhinged, if we're being honest. (laughs) So let's go. Let's get this thing started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Legends Look Back. Finally, here we are doing one of the most prolific Legends books there will ever be. 
Welcome to the show brought to you by Utini.com, a show that's been described as the most 90s thing since Will Smith playing Nintendo on a zebra rug while wearing a backwards <laughs> hat, where we talk about all things Star Wars Legends, celebrating our rich EU history as well as diving into lesser known Star Wars classics. I'm your host, Jared Mays, and today I'm joined once again, finally, not on Hoth anymore, no longer frozen with us in the flesh, or at least digitally, over Twitch. Or, or, or coming through your earbuds, if you're walking the dog, if you're doing your dishes, whatever it is, we got Freddie C. How's it going, Freddie? It's going, man. It's going. Uh, I I just set up the in the new studio because, you know, I move in constantly, it seems. But uh, it seems like we're going to go, it's going to be all right. Read a good book. I like it. I love it. And I'm pretty excited to meet our new guest for Absolutely. this week. Uh, we've got Mr. YouTube himself, you know, as... Uh, <laughs> When, when um, Freddie and I joined Utini a year and a half ago, um, you know, Utini was like, we were writing articles, okay? We were talking about, talking about starting one podcast. Now we've got like six, and we got yeah. like, you know, our podcast almost got canceled a couple times, and here we are, <laughs> and now we've got a bunch of podcasts, we got like 30 team members, and I think one of the most exciting things we've got going is our YouTube channel. Absolutely excellent content. And uh, one of the people leading that charge is Mr. YouTube himself, Jake Roto. Welcome, Jake. How's it going, man? Hey, man. How's it going? You know, it's been I better, like but we're doing okay now. <laughs> I like that intro, though. I like Mr. YouTube himself. I, uh, um, I'm a teacher, and that's how I get kind of, uh, I, you know, Oh, yeah, my you're kids Mr. Roto. Yeah, well, and then that's uh, – because they'll go in and joke now and be like, did you do another YouTube video yet? And I'm like, you bet I did. Absolutely. I you watched it. Jake, I've got um, one question for you as we get started. Yeah. Why is, why is everything purple? I I don't know. You know what? Look, even the – the uh, the I got the Rebels boxes. I see the, boxes I see the purple. From the new, I'm colorblind, purple. and even I see that purple. <laughs> purple? Why is everything purple? It's I, I mentioned that. If colors a uh, purple is a color of royalty, um, so I'll take that. Um, you know, I, I, I can dig purple, but, uh, Freddie's trying to block out his thing. purple. What's, what's Freddie doing over there? <laughs> I'm you getting your, ready for the bit. You, you, got your, you got your show notes. We do have a bit, everybody. Uh, we do have a bit. Oh, that's what Freddie's doing. Freddie, is this, um, we're trying to start a podcast, man. And here you are. You're just like, you got some kind of, what is this? A, a, a pegboard? What are you looking at, Freddie? Studying my art. Studying art, Freddie. Now it's time. The time for the podcast, man. It's not the time to be examining, you know, the art. You can decorate your Star Wars room later, man. What do you think this is? An, an art gallery? There's, you know, there's one thing you need to do to be a good Star Wars podcaster, and that's to study art. <laughs> you mean like uh, the Drew Struzan cover art that we're going to be talking about tonight? I mean, Drew Struzan, I get, don't get me wrong, I love the guy. I think tonight we've got Tom Young, actually, instead. Um, absolutely excellent. You know, if you like art, uh, maybe not our most successful bit ever, but I'm sure we'll edit it and post and it'll come out seamless. <laughs> if you like art and Star Wars, I um, am excited to announce to you that you are in absolutely the right place because today's book is none other than the Legends Masterpiece. Heir to the Empire. Today's the day. It's the moment you've been waiting for. We've got art. We've got cloning, battle meditation, hot chocolate. We've even got a shirtless, buff, deranged Jedi Master who wants to experiment on some babies. <laughs> we got space salamanders. I mean, what more do you need? Am I right? I think Nothing. you're right. That's it. Jake is maybe we... maybe one naked palp. Naked palpatine. Ugh, yeah, absolutely. That sounds wrinkly. <laughs> um. You know, I, I like the idea that while uh, Palpatine's doing his, his whole uh, naked thing in a Dark <laughs> Empire, you know, uh, Thrawn's like off in the Unknown Regions. He's like, I'm going to be in an, in an entire different galaxy if Palpatine's up to that nonsense. I'm going to just go ahead and excuse <laughs> myself, and I'll come once he's gone for real this time. And uh, totally excited for us to be talking about tonight's book and joining us. Jake, I, I was excited to get to have you on the show to talk about this book because you just recently read this. Yeah. Um, tell me about uh, your history with this book. It was your first time ever. Yeah. This, this wasn't a reread for you. No, it was my first time. Um, you know, I I always knew that it was there. Uh, you know, I grew up a huge Star Wars fan, and the books I just kind of put off to the side for the longest time. 
um, just because it's, you know, I had some of them. I read some of the Jedi Academy books when I was younger. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, and yeah. I was, I, yeah, I mean, I know that you are, you're a big fan of those, but I was a prequels kid. And so for the longest time, you know, I, I was, I'll be 31 in November. So I was, you know, in my single digits going through the 90s. And then I was about 10 years old when The Phantom Menace came out. So like my whole, all the teenage years, I was, I liked the prequels. I grew up with that and I loved all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I stuck to that. Um, but then, whenever they started the new, um, the sequel trilogy, I jumped into reading a lot of the canon books as they were coming out because I was like, "Now is a good a time as ever to absolutely start reading." And then that's when it kind of opened up into like, there are so many of these legends books now that I haven't read, and so "Heir to the Empire" is like universally recommended by anybody. Is this is the first book that you want to read? And it was just in the legends timeline and it i mean it just i was not surprised at how much i loved it but like i i was captivated very early like i i could visualize so many things yeah and it was kind of a weird per, not weird perspective a unique perspective um you know i'd already read the new con thron canon trilogy oh sure um, yeah. I, so i'd already seen rebels i already knew who rook was i already knew who thron was in the new canon so to go back and see them in a different light yeah very different but, light. but then to so many people that's the original right. you know, those are the original so i was <laughs> yeah. kind of back really is a unique perspective let us know in the chat everybody anybody else in the same boat as wes what came first for you uh rebels thrawn or heir to the empire thrawn uh, i'd love to get your input on that how about you freddie what's your history with this book i think this was reread number five could have been seven for me i have no idea at this point if i'm having a bad day this is definitely a go-to Long road trip, yeah. nothing to listen to. Heir to the Empire for sure. Now, what about you, Freddie? Yeah, so, uh, man, the first time I, I saw this at a, a library, checked it out. Honestly, I was too young to really understand what the heck was going on. I didn't, I didn't really get it too much. Uh, my third reread, I was, was probably like 2012, definitely around 2012. And uh, I, I just felt like I had to read it again. And it was, it's funny because <laughs> I don't know if anyone remembers this. This is a super, I don't, it, it seemed rare because I don't hear anybody talk about it, but it was the Star Wars action team. I'm not sure if anyone no remembers being a part of that. About, and that is exciting to me. Del Rey had, uh, oh, I think it was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the yeah. first book, the first book that I ordered using all the points that I gathered was it this from bad Del Rey boy? was that bad boy right there yeah that's where i got mine too <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah they sent us uh 30 books for like reviewing uh, star wars books on barnes and noble amazon and um yep. okay jake's got one too all right but uh amazon jake, jake did you have to pay for yours because freddie and i, I got ours for, for the hard work of <laughs> posting pictures of our favorite star wars characters I came yeah. after the fact, yeah, I got mine <laughs> off Amazon after, so seventeen ninety nine. There you go. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to be talking about this edition <laughs> in just a second. Freddie, if you had to guess, how many times do you think you've read this book? <sighs> this will be my, I would. Uh-oh, lost Freddie for... Freddy there for a second. Say fifth to okay. seventh time. Fifth, fifth to seventh time? Oh, no. All right, we've, we've yeah, vamped for fifth you. Fifth to seventh time. Fifth to seventh time. All right, so same boat as me. Uh, as soon as we're done with the podcast tonight, I'm going to have to read it one more time so I can beat Freddie. Because uh, <laughs> if there's one thing that's true about me, other than the fact that I come easily unhinged, is the fact that I'm very, very competitive. I'm so competitive, in fact, that uh, secretly, uh, none of the other Utini team members know about this. I'm about to out you, Meg. Uh, Meg and I have been doing secret races um, digitally. We're like, we'll try to one up each other in terms of mileage and pace, like actually running. You know, <laughs> Meg and I are both runners, so we've been racing each other from across the country. That's how competitive I am, okay? Uh, I'm seeing some good answers there in the chat. Uh, we've got some great stuff coming. We've got uh, uh, Eric saying that his number one Thrawn is Ascendancy Thrawn, which I find absolutely baffling. But uh, hey, I like that we've got some diversity on the team here. Uh, I'm I'm still trying to make my way through Ascendancy. It just, just doesn't vibe for me like this does. But, hey, you know, to each his own. Um, I'm the Legends guy for a reason. Joxie is in the <laughs> same boat with you, um, Jake, who says that um, Canon Rebels Thrawn, you know, was The his, biggest thing for me was the Thrawn. voice. It was the voice because, I mean, Mark Thompson, so many characters, Mark Thompson with the audiobooks, is, he's, he 
brings them to life as far as yeah. the audio goes. Right. And that was when I first listened to the Canon Thrawn book that that came out with the, the new ones. Um, you know, it was that, you know, uh, Captain Pelion, what are you mm. doing over here? You know, the call of the Chimera. We're gonna uh, and then Eric Rebels. Here just to do the impression. Yeah, he for does. Else. He'll come on for I five do. minutes and then leave. So, but that, like, that was so the visual, the mannerism, so many things yeah, I pulled Lars, out of that, that Lars voice. Lars Mickelson voice that he impersonates. Yeah. And then the Mark Thompson version in the, the trilogy from the 90s, it was very like, oh, Captain Pelion. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for me, that was, that's, that's been my Legends Thrawn for a long time. Yeah. So much that we've got to talk about. Tonight's going to be our character center uh, character-centric episode. We're going to do this in two parts. We're going to go all Thrawn all the time on Legends Look Back this fall, okay? This is the fall of Thrawn, not like the demise of Thrawn, because he's got a couple of those, and they're both awesome. Even though Wes in the chat says he thinks the Legends demise is lackluster. We'll save that for another episode. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the introduction of these characters in Heir to the Empire. Next week, we're going to look at the overarching questions, and I've seen some of our incredible patrons and listeners and team members in the chat saying, They've got some stuff they want to talk about when it comes to Heir to the Empire. And I'm going to say, throw those questions in the Discord. The more, the merrier, because that means the more questions you write, the fewer that I have to write. All right? <laughs> and um, it's been a busy couple of weeks for me. Uh, uh, some more behind-the-scenes info before we get into these character questions. Uh, of course, this book was published in 1991. Uh, fun fact is it was being published, it was being written concurrently with Dark Empire. So both Tom Veach and uh, Timothy Zahn are writing very different stories of what happens after Return of the Jedi at the same time. And so uh, you wonder about the departures story-wise with these two stories. Uh, which one's better? Who's to say? Love them both with, you know, as if they're my own children, okay? You can retcon them to try to make them fit, but especially when it comes to Luke's character, we'll talk more about Luke Pretty, pretty drastic departures. Came out in 1991. The Star Wars book line was being revamped, rebooted. Uh, and of course, Freddie, if you've read that behind-the-scenes version, you know that whole story, right? The fact that uh, Tim Zahn was approached about this. Would you like to write a Star Wars book? And and as soon as I say that, Freddie disappears. So, that's awesome. Freddie will be back while we continue with our introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie's Freddy's, uh, as back and forth. It's like he's jumping to hyperspace and He's got the space whales just coming in and jumping them in and out. Uh, what else do we need to know about the behind the scenes on Air to the Empire here? Who knows what's happening with Freddy? Who knows? Uh, we'll get it figured out. Get it figured out. Um, with behind the scenes, 1991, Star Wars books were being rebooted and revamped. Timothy Zahn was approached this. His number one concern was, how can I capture the voices of the original characters? In his behind the scenes um, look at this book, he said that um, whatever is between those quotation marks, whenever it says Han is speaking, the characters need to be able to hear Han is speaking. If Leia is speaking, they need to be able to hear Leia speaking. He felt the tremendous weight of responsibility, and it shows. It really shows. For whatever other gripes you might have with the book, um, he absolutely captured the voices of those original characters. It does take place five years after Return of the Jedi, so some time has passed, which, of course, allows for some other great Legends stories to fill the gaps in between. Specifically, uh, we're going to have all the X-Wing books and Freddy's favorite, the Truce at Bakura, going back and filling in that story. We're also going to be talking about cover art. The original cover art for these, we're going to show off a little bit here, was by infamous Star Wars artist Tom Young. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, Jake, what do you think... Um, do you know of any other artwork done for Star Wars by Tom Young? Have you heard that that name before? I've heard the name mainly in the past like couple weeks. Well, I mean, I probably read Air to the M. It was over the summer, but as I've kind of Googled it because I I like to have the visuals of the characters, and when you type in Sabiath and all those types of things, I would see his name pop up as far as like the artistic pieces of it. So, but I don't know what else he's done. I don't know what else he's... Everybody Google it. It's Tom Young with a J. At least I think that's how it's pronounced instead of Jung. I think it's Young. Um, he, of course, is most famous uh, for his portrayal of um, the original concept painting, the original concept poster for A New Hope. That oh, very that's... iconic holding... You can see my armpit. Yes. Uh, holding the... Uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> the lightsaber up above his head like he's a Power Ranger. Saucy. Yeah. No, um, I do. Yes, that's where I knew that from because that's like the buff Luke in like the sultry right. Leia with yeah. the, the sultry, leg that's out. A, such a good word. Such a good description of <laughs> we've been doing SAT prep. Okay. Class. Yeah, you're learning all your vocab words. Everybody, um, yeah. tell Jake's students the fact that uh, <laughs> you know his. <laughs> He's doing great with his vocabulary words. Yeah. Freddie, I'm going to try to reboot your camera on my end. Don't do anything. You're, you're looking good to me in another browser window. So um, hang about in there. Gone with the wind. So we can hear you, Freddie. Gone with the wind's too long to read in school. <laughs> don't you yeah, wish you I had a teacher uh... as cool as Freddie? Uh, Freddie, don't you wish you had a teacher as cool as Jake when you were in high school? <laughs> yes, I do. He would have given me all the Star Wars books to read. Yeah, well, that's the I, see. I used to teach ninth graders, and we would the Odyssey. I taught Star Wars with the Odyssey because we would teach about archetypes and how, like, so many people that very first Star Wars movie, it's the same story that's been told over and over and over. And George Lucas has talked about that. You know, we hit the damsel in distress. We hit uh, Han Solo's the scoundrel, and he's got his loyal sidekick Chewbacca, okay. yeah. and the Millennium Falcon is the trusty steed. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a good book to teach with a lot of that kind of stuff. So anytime you can bring Star Wars in, totally do it. Awesome. You know, I love that. I, uh, was absolutely humiliated by my sixth grade English teacher for re doing a book report on a Star Wars book. And you know what I did oh. to, sh to prove her how wrong I think she is? I started my own podcast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's how dedicated I am. When with an English teacher. Whatever you, I should have her on. Now that would be a fun episode <laughs> of Legends Look Back. Me and Miss Jeffries. Just the entire episode is her apologizing to me. No. <laughs> Miss Jefferson hey man, is a wonderful teacher. My view is if a kid's reading a book, read a book. There you so go. Open it up. Right. Yeah. Let them read whatever they want to read, especially yeah. with Star Wars, though. No Star Trek books. Oh, yeah. No Star Trek books. No Star Trek. That's funny. We, uh, Freddy, if you'll just refresh that, your your OBS Ninja, we'll, uh, we'll keep going, see if we can get that uh, video fixed on our end uh some other fun behind the scenes stuff that's worth covering of course uh, we've talked about the fact that it, this has got the amazing uh, tom young art now a lot of people uh, I've, I've heard some criticisms of the art uh, if you were to rank the original tom young heir to the empire art um on a scale of one to ten where would you rank this out of all of the the star wars art you've ever seen jake where would you put this original artwork they've they've recently been given new covers which mm, I, mm. I quite uh, find, find very, very I, I offensive. I love the new covers. I find it oh. very offensive that we had to get new covers for what, I, something that was already perfect. I'd give it a six okay. in total Star Wars art. I'd give it, it sits in the middle for me. I remember being a kid seeing that Sabaoth and first wondering, like, who is this? Second, being like, when did Gandalf move over to <laughs> Star Wars? Like, Just that Aaron. was. <laughs> yeah, when did Ster when did Gandalf start taking steroids and move to a galaxy far, far away from Middle Earth? Um, I, I remember seeing it as a kid. That's one of those things where I mean, it was just it was around, um, and you know, I like the kind of um, you know misty atmosphere that the the Tom Young uh, works have. You know, it's kind of like uh, dreamlike almost. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I do. Yeah, There's when a you see word for you. Yes. I'm writing that one down for tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I I like that aspect of it where it's a little otherworldly. I like the new covers mainly because I like the continuity between all of them, like how you can line them all up and get the whole scene. Yeah. Um, that kind of stuff. But I, you know, he's I'd probably probably put it in a, about a solid 6, a little more than halfway, but it's not my favorite. All right, there's Freddie. I found the button to press. Uh, let us know in the chat, how would you rank this original Tom Young art? Uh, a, another Star Wars Expanded Universe website. Now, I want to be really clear, we're repping Utini.com, but hey, I've got some other interests. Uh, one of my favorite sites is Club Jade. Um, they infamously have ranked these as the worst Star Wars covers of all time, um, which I find humorous, even though I disagree. Uh, another one of my favorite Star Wars Legends podcasts is, uh, and I, I talk about them all the time, a huge fan of Rogue Podron. Um, one of the guys on Rogue Padron calls this picture of Jeruus Sabayoth, he calls him Buff Obi-Wan. And so I've <laughs> <laughs> forever called him that. I mean, just look at the abs on abs on abs. I mean, he could start for your high school football team, couldn't he, uh, Jake? 
<laughs> yeah, but, but it, to me, that's like it's just Ga- you cannot pass. So like it's funny. Gandalf taking the Balrog down. But I've uh, I've had to shift my. You shift know my what's especially there. funny about it is the fact that in the book he's described as this wispy and lean. Tom Young <laughs> is like I see you're wispy and lean, and I rub you. I uh, I <laughs> yeah. I raise you. I raise well, you a ten pack. Uh, that was a Freudian slip if ever there was. Doesn't. One. Doesn't Luke or Mara, when they finally, it, I, it's not an heir to the Empire, but when they do, isn't there a description later where they come in and say, like, that he's incredibly fit for his age? And I don't, like, that makes me wonder now, like, did Zahn put that in intentionally because that's how he was portrayed oh on the gosh. cover of the first book? That's but, like, hilarious. one of them does mention it at one point, like, he's incredibly fit for his age. <laughs> I'm not sure we'll have to find the quote on that. I do have some yeah. other quotes for us this episode is over and we're gonna go way too long if we don't move on i will say with the art there is one other set of art that i want to rep and that is the portuguese covers on these by mark simonetti are absolutely some of my favorite star wars art of all time have you ever seen these before freddie no i have not i'm looking at it now well here we go i got uh, a little bit of it up here on the stream for us there's more though Goodness everybody gracious. so please uh, i'll throw them up in the discord you can also do a little bit of google searching mark simonetti um portuguese brazilian uh heir to the empire art uh, thrawn Those trilogy are awesome. art. absolutely spectacular i've used these on all kinds of wallpapers for my phones and computers over the years um now that uh, we've got this ios 14 i went ahead and threw that uh that Jerua Sabayoth's uh, Force Lightning image right there on my phone, uh, coming up big in a big way. Absolutely love it. Some spectacular art. Um, and so let us know in the chat. You know, let us know in the Discord which of the sets of art do you like the most? Do you like the Tom Young original covers? Uh, do you like the Brazilian art? Do you like the new covers? Which is especially funny. One last fun fact on the art: Club Jade did a calculation a few years ago, back in 2016, when these new covers came out, and they did the math, okay? The new covers, this was right after the reintroduction of Thrawn into Rebels, the new covers have approximately 275% more Thrawn on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> because when in doubt, give us more Thrawn, am I right? Yeah, can't um, go wrong. Freddie, you want to talk about the alternative titles? Uh, I wanted to play a little game here, Okay. Uh, don't look at this in the show notes. Give me just a second, and it, uh, everybody, I want to hear your best guesses. I'm going to read off some titles here, and I want to hear your best guess. Which of these titles were actually considered as alternative titles for Heir to the Empire? Okay? These were potential titles pitched by Timothy Zahn. Some of these are real. Some of these are fake. So I want to hear your best guesses on which of these are real and which ones are fake. Are you ready, Freddie? Let's do it. Every time I say that, I promise everybody, it's not like <laughs> supposed to be a joke. It's it's just naturally just coming off my tongue. Okay, some potential titles. Wild Card. Luke Skywalker and the Mission to Mirker. The Emperor's Hand. The Grand Admiral. Space Salamanders, a Star Wars story. Yeah. All right, out of all of those, ready, you're going to start us off. Um, give me just one. Which one of those do you think is a real title? It's got to be the Space the Salamanders, one. right? Absolutely. That was it. That's, <laughs> the, that sounds like... Actually, the uh, Salamari are actually described as Salamander-like in the book. As if the name Salamari wasn't enough of a dead giveaway. He, Zahn actually describes them as... I had to Google it. As, you had to Google it? I had to Google it. The description wasn't working for me in the book. <laughs> well, the fun thing is you could always read the graphic novel adaptation, which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah. All right, Freddie, what's your best guess? All right, so if I had to go with a very legends title, especially for this era, I would say Luke Skywalker and the Mission to Merker. That just sounds Oh, you very say Merker, legendary. huh? I say Mirker. <laughs> exactly, say Merker. there you go. That's the reason why. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to have a, a, a Thrawn-style um, like military tactician battle to decide this one one of these days. We can probably do that over social distance. You know, you command your fleet, I command mine, and uh, we'll see who likes art the most, right? That's how this works. That's how or works, right? Okay, Jake, what's your best guess? Ready? I hate I... to break it to you. Luke Skywalker and the mission to Mirker is something that I made up. So thank you. Mirker. All right. The what's... Grand Admiral sounds like it would be a legit title. 
considering that Thrawn in his carryover and like his role, I'm gonna vote for the Grand Admiral. I'm absolutely flattered. That's another one that I made up. All right, we're oh, over, we're over. Are two, you kidding me? Two and zero oh for Jared. All right, um, no, I'm absolutely serious. There are two of these that were actually pitched as potential titles by Timothy Zahn. Before I spoil it, let's see what other answers we've got in the chat. Um, if I, I can find it was the Salamanders. If I can find the right window here. It's got the chat stream somewhere. Okay, Wes says the second one. Well, that doesn't help me. Which one is the, <laughs> the second one? Cheryl says the Emperor's Hand. And Cheryl, congratulations. You win the prize ah. of being patron of the night. Patron of the night goes to Cheryl. Uh, you get a virtual high five. Um, and the grand... Um, I guess the, I the, could the, see the that. The Emperor's Hand was actually a title that he pitched. But his number one title... The number one title that Timothy Zahn pitched that he fought for with his editors that was shot down was Wild Card. Why? Because of Card. His, his name is <laughs> yeah. Alan Card. I do love Card. Every single yeah. thing surrounding thr- uh, Card in the book is a pun. Every single ship, uh, every yeah. little detail with Card is a pun. It's, it's, almost, it's almost cringeworthy. Um, yeah. And so what was Wes's guess? We'll see if I can find it. It was uh, the one that I talked about, the okay. mission to uh, Merker. Luke Skywalker and the mission to Merker. I, I chose Kier. that because, you know, you've got the Lando Calrissian and the Mind Harp of Sharu, Han Solo mm-hmm. at Star's End, um, Luke Skywalker and the Shadows of Mindor. I thought it was a Legends U title. So, um, it was. You did a really good, good job. It is. We can yeah. go ahead and we I'm really proud of you, Jared. Thanks, man. We can go ahead and wrap the show up now. No, no, no. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, I will say some related materials worth checking out. We won't spend a lot of time talking about this for the sake of time. We've got a Dark Horse Comics adaptation, which Jake has in his um, Legends Epic Collection. It's collected most recently in the Legends Epic Collection volume, The New Republic, volume four. Jake's showing that off. I read that. This week in preparation for the show, it's it's a great way to get... You want to know what uh, one version of what Nogri might look like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they do a great job at showing uh, Wayland, that planet. And depicting... I like the the Dreadnoughts. I like seeing the Dreadnoughts. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, it really shows you what the space battles might look like yeah. in their absolute finest. Um, it's an absolutely great depiction of the characters and uh, the battles and the planets all that good stuff. Uh, it's a six issue series. Is that right, Jake? Mm, uh, yeah. And if you get, yeah, each one of them is six. Um, and so if you get the, if you find the Epic collection, I found mine at a books a million. Um, you get all of them in one, which was nice. Awesome. Cause I could just go all the way through. Awesome. Um, I will say that, uh, another great behind the scenes thing to check out is the, um, as we've mentioned, the 20th, anniversary heir to the empire hardback which has notes in the margins both from timothy zahn and his editor uh, which is a lot of fun to kind of hear their behind the scenes ideas of you know what they remember of having written the book this came out in 2011 and finally one other thing to check out would be the uh, the west end game source book uh, which came out in 1992 definitely an old school legends thing i picked it up just a few months ago uh, went through it. It gives some great behind-the-scenes information. It's got some original artwork. Look at this Lando. I mean, for crying out loud, look how oh, gorgeous that's sweet. this Lando is. It's even got some original fiction that's published in here as um, you know some uh, some filler detail. It tells you how Pelion met Thrawn. I mean, if that's not hmm. a, like a TV show that we need, I don't know what is. How I Met Your Thrawn. I mean, it just writes itself, <laughs> doesn't it? Absolutely writes itself. Well, before we get into it anymore... Um, We are going to go ahead and kick it off with a summary, and this is your spoiler warning, everybody. If you have not read Heir to the Empire, we will spoil it. What we won't do is spoil other books in this series or major fates of players like uh, Mara Jade or, uh, you know, what happens to Grand Admiral Thrawn. We won't talk about all of that in this episode, which, uh, by the way, Jake, don't spoil these two major details. (laughs) (laughs) Besides that, everything in this book is fair game and we not only will spoil it but we can't wait to spoil it there's some awesome stuff in this that we are dying to talk about freddy's back and hopefully all of you are still with us and we haven't lost anybody to the spoiler warning 
without further ado, here we go. It's been five years since the Battle of Endor. The New Republic is taking control of the galaxy, but honestly still has a long way to go. A mysterious new Imperial Grand Admiral commanding the Star Destroyer Chimera are having tremendous success due to his tactical genius. Thrawn travels to Mirkur to capture Yasalamari, space salamanders that have adapted to repel the Force, which Thrawn uses to protect himself from the crazed dark Jedi Jeruus Sabaoth. Notice the double vowels. Because he's a clone. He's not the original Jedi Master, who uh, was from the Clone Wars era Joris Sabaoth. Uh, Sabaoth. No, this is a, a crazy clone version. Jeruus Sabaoth. Pay attention to those vowels, everybody. It's going to come up again later. He's been guarding the Emperor's storage vault on Wayland. There, Thrawn enlists him to his cause. He uh, wants him to be able to seize the cloaking technology that's within the Emperor's storehouse on Wayland. He also wants to use Sabaoth's um, battle meditation, the number one force power in all of Legends, to be able to help command the fleet to greater victories over the rebels. His ultimate plan is to make an assault on the New Republic's shipyards at Sluis Vaughn, or at least in this book, that's the plan. Meanwhile, Luke, out searching for the voice from the Force vision of Jeruus Sabaoth that he's been hearing, just absolutely desperate to meet another Jedi, he's, hit, he's ambushed by Thrawn en route, but then, due to some crazy piloting, he escapes. Unfortunately, his ingenious maneuver ends up crippling his X-Wing, leaving him stranded in space, so he's rescued by Mara Jade, held captive by Taloncard on Mirkur, who's hiding him from Thrawn because, you know, Taloncard, he's morally gray. He's not just going to hand him over to the Imperials, but he'll definitely just imprison him in his garage. Luke escapes by hot-wiring his cell door's control panel by using the power of his prosthetic hand, which is probably my favorite scene in all of Legends, if we're being honest. Luke is chased by Mara Jade, who shoots him down, and they both crash land in the forest. Mara is a former special agent for the Emperor. She hates Luke, wants to kill him, but Luke convinces her that he's useful because he's such a nice guy. And the, <laughs> and the pair, plus R2, make their way out of the forest in a sleepless three-day struggle fest in which they're constantly attacked by Vornskers. That's right, I just said Vornskers. That's a thing. Which are some canine-like creatures that evolved to hunt Force sensitives. Han and Lando are out recruiting smugglers to join the New Republic, including Talon Card on Mirker. So what do you know? They show up just in the nick of time. Thrawn, of course, who's no dummy, suspects Card of treachery, sends his own patrol to hunt for Luke and Mara, and it all comes to a head in a massive shootout in which Card betrays Thrawn, the heroes escape, and head to Sluis, the Sluis Van shipyards in an attempt to thwart whatever Thrawn is planning there. During all of this, Chewie takes Leia to Kashyyyk to lay low because, you know, she almost got straight up kidnapped by the little gray aliens called Nogri, which uh, humorously Zahn wrote as his version of scarier Ewoks because uh, <laughs> Zahn wasn't a big fan of the Ewoks, so he wanted to give his version. It's just absolutely awesome. Uh, some uh, huge yeah. shout out to the Nogri. There's a whole heck of a lot of Wookiee growling during this part of the book, which really comes across <laughs> great in the audiobook. Don't worry, everybody. I've got a clip. Anyway, Thrawn, ever perceptive, sniffs out the deception, sends more Nogri assassins to Kashyyyk. The Nogri, the, the Nogri are actually weirdly infatuated with Leia, calling her Lady Vader, because they viewed Darth Vader as like kind of their savior, which was an interesting twist. Leia, a crack politician, plays along, does a deal with the Nogri for, for um, them to take her to his home world for some good old-fashioned negotiating and zero murder. Seriously, please don't murder me. The book's climactic conclusion is a massive space battle at Sluis Van, where Thrawn uses the mole miners he stole from Lando to steal the New Republic's ships, but Wedge and Rogue Squadron show up to help Han and Lando hatch a plan to just use the mole miners to destroy the ships altogether rather than give them to Thrawn. Thrawn, therefore, is thwarted but says, don't worry, it's not actually that big a deal, because he's got lots of other plans and this is only a mere inconvenience. Whew, I'm going to need a drink after that. Freddy, rate this on a scale of 1 to 10. Please tell me it doesn't get, get anything less than a 10. So first of all, your narration of the summary was a 10 out of 10. So <laughs> let's just give that straight least, out the I at least wrote the, the summary this week. You know, some weeks it's yeah. kind of hit or miss. I wrote the whole thing this time. <laughs> I just want to give you credit for that. That was that was good. Thanks, I, I was I was right Struggle there with fest. you. Struggle fest. You like <laughs> that word? Yeah, yeah, I like that. 
You know, Zahn would hate uh, it. Zahn would learn a lot about me from my summary, I think. Not Zahn, Thrawn. I'm going to get those confused the whole episode. Uh, Where do you rate this one? Yeah, man, this is, I love this book. And and the reason why I love it is the story that came with it of my discovery. But just off the content itself, it, it takes you in so many directions. There's so many, and we'll talk about a lot of this, right? This is, this is the point of the podcast. But uh, just for nostalgia and just how much I like it, it's right there. Uh, 10 out of 10 for me. Uh, if I, I'm trying to come at it non biasedly, just, you know, yeah. you got to, you got to try to be unbiased. as a fan. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. And it's hard. Honestly, it's really hard for me to lower any, anywhere lower than a 10. And that's just my opinion on it. Okay. Uh, how about you, Jake? Where would you rate this? Uh, Freddie's going to go ahead and begrudgingly give it a 10, acknowledging his <laughs> own, you know, acknowledging his own bias. I was saying, you know, it is pretty nostalgic. What about you, Jake? You just came to it this year in 2020. How's it rate? Don't be afraid of hurting my you feelings, know, but you know, this is no, seriously. I, you won't be on next week if you rate it. Too low. <laughs> I, you know, I'm trying to think which Star Wars book is my ten. Um, I mean, so you know, it, it's definitely my favorite Legends book that I've read, and I, you know, even if I say it's a nine, it's leaning towards a ten. Uh, you know, it's one of like I try and. I thought about this when I was looking through the Utini, the way that they score things. Like there's only so many books that are considered a masterpiece. Revenge of the Sith is a masterpiece. And this is really close. Um, you know, I'd give it a like a nine and a half going into a 10 just because it's like, I try to reserve that 10 spot for the ones that like, yeah, you know, That's if good. the world ended and I got to carry them around in my backpack, would I take this one? But you know, it's, it's, it's as high as you can go really. Um, I don't I don't know that I'm yet at the point where I'm gonna say it's my favorite Star Wars book of all time. I mean, if we have to settle for a nine and a half, like I'm happy with that. <laughs> all right, if we've got to settle for it. Um I'm gonna go ahead and give it a ten as well. I would rate this as one of only, you know, uh, I would say maybe five or six Star Wars books I would call an absolute masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Mostly because he does such an incredible job at capturing the voices of yeah. the original characters, and then he writes some really incredible original characters. You got Thrawn, you got Mara Jade, Talon Card, uh, Borsk Phalia, the worst, but perfectly the worst. Absolutely perfectly the worst. Yes. Some absolutely great original characters. However, I will say, uh, since we have all given this a nine and a half or up, um, it has become popular on the internet lately to hate on Heir to the Empire. So I do want to try to give a little bit of, uh, you know, a balanced perspective on those who might disagree with us just this week. In a Reddit group that I'm in on the Star Wars book subreddit, somebody posted how they just read Heir to the Empire for a first time, and they called it, and I quote, an underwhelming milestone. So, you know, people do disagree with us, um, but let's be honest, we're right. All right. Yeah. And we're going we're gonna to get into why we are. Um, yeah. And we can talk about what those reasons are. If you're curious on why somebody didn't like it, let me know. I'll, I'd be happy to share it with you in the Discord. I'm not going to give this, this Joker any more uh, credit during our episode than we have to. So let's start off with the characters. We'll start with the the, the Morley Gray characters. And we're going to move into the heroes and then finally our villains. Freddy, let's start off with Mara. First of all, Mara absolutely hates Luke. And it's really yeah. clear early on yeah. that uh, they're absolutely made for each other. So, it's so funny. <laughs> so It's so funny how much she despises him and he's just like, what? What did I do? <laughs> because in this book, Luke is a all caps nice guy isn't he i mean the very first scene with luke in this book he's drinking hot chocolate for crying out loud (laughs) if that doesn't signal to you and to tom veach and the entire crew writing dark empire where luke is a baddie uh he's edgy in this book he is got some serious suburban dad energy i mean in this book (laughs) he's just like drinking hot chocolate the the edgy girl is like hitting on him and he's like you know you know i know you hate me but you should probably not kill me because i'm a nice guy (laughs) <laughs> so it Freddy, makes me uh go ahead jake it reminds me of um in uh in the battlefront 2 campaign whenever uh they're going through the emperor's observatory and uh dell asks him like why do you why are you helping or why do I, should i give this to you and he's like because i asked and yeah. like that that's just that, <laughs> that vibe of yeah, like absolutely they how can you that. argue with that i just played that a couple weeks ago jake I finally yeah. left the party on this one it's only like a because three-year-old video game <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good wait. point Make my way through it. Um, why do you think, Freddy, that Mara hates Luke so much? What is it that's got her so triggered when it comes to Luke Skywalker? Well, it's definitely her her ex boss. That's for sure. Uh, good old Palps, <laughs> just uh, you know, 
Luke coming in and ruining everything. And of course, she's she's bitter with with all of that uh, nonsense. But you know, she, <laughs> as we all know, she te- she earns uh, or he earns her her trust and eventually her love. So, right, um, Jake, what's your best estimation on this? Why do you think um, that Mara hates Luke so much? Is it more uh, Luke ruining her life, or is it more Palpatine's influence? Um, I think neither. I think she's a little jealous. Because I think that she knew, I mean, I think Palpatine's influence was definitely there, but I, you know, from when I look at it from this literary perspective and the character development, and I try and step into it, you know, I think part of it is that when Mara really learned about Luke and what he was doing and how he was doing it, she was this character that was kind of trapped at this point you know the emperor had his hold on her and you know she was able you know the jealousy isn't there like oh i'm mad that you have something that i don't but you know i think so much of her resentment for luke was that he was who she couldn't be you know i think this is why we gotta have jake on the show this is some good insight (laughs) here i like it um thanks but i mean that that's the way i kind of see it is that she she had good in her You know, the same way that, you know, we kind of see that a lot of these gray characters, uh, you know, start to lean towards the good side. You know, we have this we no longer have a Vader character in the stories where we we have this character that's kind of battling with the goodness that's in them. And she wanted so hard to stay loyal to the emperor. But I think so much of her resentment with Luke was that she you know, she had these powers, she had this force power that she couldn't really control and didn't know what to do with. And the emperor gave her that. But she. I feel like so much of her character was like, if I was only in Luke's shoes, I would be in a much different situation now. So I, mean, I think let's so, be honest, so much of what she hated, yeah. Mara's way cooler than Luke. Luke's not cool. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's he doesn't of, have the swagger she has. He never got, was. She's got so it. much swagger. And that's yeah. a very 90s uh, woman uh, sci-fi character thing to do. However, Mara's character definitely endures beyond that trope. And has some yeah. incredible uh, development beyond that in all of Legends. And we're just barely scratching the surface here. You know, few yes. characters in the EU have a larger legacy than Mara Jade. I mean, how many times has George Lucas or Dave Filoni gone on record answering questions about Mara Jade? Just this <laughs> week, for crying out loud, Mark Hamill himself tweeted that he wants to see Mara Jade made canon again. Mark Hamill. That's, I mean, that, just this week. Perfect timing for us to be doing this show. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know George was very. He was not fond of Mara at yeah. all. Uh, you think, I didn't know that. You think George actually read these books? Uh, he probably read enough to to know he he didn't like Mara, and I think he always had this idea that Luke was like a monk, right? Yeah, and he didn't want Luke to to get in that same Celebrate relationship. Celebrate to the end. Yeah, mm-hmm. but everybody else was like, "No, bro, <laughs> we want we want uh, a character who." And you know what? I I thought Mara Jade was. I liked her a lot. I like her character. I like her personality. Uh, I like what she, I like, I guess what I'm trying to say is she gives something to Luke that Luke doesn't have. If you mm. just read Luke by himself. Yeah. I just realized I didn't have you on the screen there, Freddie. Sorry. Um, here you are again. It was a great point. Regardless, of course, for our audio listeners, they don't have a clue that we couldn't see you. I will say this, you know, <laughs> we're talking about the fact that very few characters cast a larger shadow on all of Star Wars than Mara Jade, other than maybe Thrawn. <laughs> who's now canon again so that's awesome but if you were to describe mara in one word just from her initial first impression in this book in this book alone without spoiling um you know her her where she's gonna go in all of legends what one word would you use to describe mara um jake why don't you kick us off here what's your one word and uh, feel free to chime in in the chat i like that cheryl gives us a great answer she embodied everything i am I am not. Everything I am not. That's a big difference there. And I admired all her strong and vulnerable qualities. Ah, oh, mm. it's so beautifully said. Cheryl, you're going to make me cry. Um, what do you think, Jake? What's your one word for Mara? Cheryl says angst. resilient. You say angst. Ooh. Angst. <laughs> Why angst? Uh, I just, because I feel like so much, and I don't say that in terms of like, you know, the angsty teenager so much as like angst in the terms of that she or dread i don't i don't think she's scared of the emperor so i feel like she just feels so much weight still coming down on her that she doesn't know what to do and so her angst comes into the you know her her reluctance to kind of see the good in luke even though he's 
being nice to her despite the fact that she's told him she wants to kill him. You know, she's just got a weight on her that yeah. is making her kind of angsty to towards Card, angsty towards Luke. Um, I got to put all of this in the yeah. Mara character guide. I got to go back and re and edit our uh, our collection. Make sure we get these I mean, descriptors I, in there. Resilient yeah. angst. What's your word, Freddie? Uh, you know, I've been thinking about this one. I saw this in the show notes. Or well, it, it it really when I was reading it, I just realized how capable she is. She's oh, capable, yeah. and I that's the word I give her because, I mean, first of all, I don't feel like you would pair anybody with Luke who isn't capable. Whoever is going to be along the the ride with Luke, whether they're incapable at the beginning will become capable because of his courage and, and sure. yeah. you know, I mean, everything good that he stands for. And that's that they're oh. going to be the embodiment as well. So, yeah, he empowers and equips, uh, but he could easily overshadow. And and she doesn't, which is he doesn't overshadow her, which is um, incredible. Honestly, that Zahn was able to do this. Um, I, I like these descriptors that we've got here. This is incredible stuff. My word for her in this book is bitter. Now, uh, this is my Bible connection of the week. We need to have some kind of a jingle to do that whenever this happens. Um, in fact, the Old Testament book of Ruth, which there's no excuse, everybody, for not having read the book of Ruth. It's only four chapters long. If you had time to read Heir to the Empire, which is, uh, you know, 350 pages, you can read the book of Ruth. It's two pages. Uh, the book of Ruth, the name Mara, actually comes up. It's a Hebrew word. Uh, putting my seminary education to use here. The Hebrew word for Mara actually means bitter. So in this book, this is my word for Mara, is she's bitter. She's really bitter in this book. And I wonder how much, you know, Zahn knew this. Maybe one of these days we'll have him on the podcast and ask him. Uh, should have had the Living <laughs> Force guys ask him. We've got another interview with Zahn coming out maybe <laughs> maybe even tomorrow. No, 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 it's with, it's with Mark Thompson. Never mind. One of these days we'll have him on Legends Look Back and we'll ask him. But the name Mara means bitter in Hebrew. And um, there's a character, Naomi, in the book of Ruth who just lost her husband, her whole world fell apart, and her son. And hmm. um, she says, you know, I I'm going through a name change, and we're going to use, you can call me Mara from now on. Uh, spoiler alert, she lives happily ever after at the end of the book. But, uh, of course, at this point, uh, it for me is, anytime I'm reading the book of Ruth, I'm like, Star Wars, it's Star Wars, it's got Mara Jade. <laughs> uh, I will say this much for Naomi in the book of Ruth, she's not nearly as cool as Mara Jade, because honestly, who is? Who is? Yeah. Uh, Mara's not the only original character in this book that Zahn originates. Another standout, of course, is Talon Card. In the 20th anniversary behind the scenes edition, Zahn said on record that he envisioned Talon Card as a version of who Han might have become if he hadn't fallen in with Luke and Leia in the most likely cantina in A New Hope. He's morally gray, but with his own, own code of honor. Freddy, do you think that's true for Card? Do you think that, that Zahn is right about his own character there? Or do you see him differently? I see, I see him a little differently. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't... I don't want this to come off negatively, but I feel like Talon Card is way more capable than Han Solo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I yeah, I mean, he's got his own, like, secret base. Yeah, he's got a secret base. He's got, like, a group of people who follow him. I mean, Mara Jade is, like, his right-hand woman, right? Yeah. I mean, he, he seems way more capable than, than Han, who's kind of just stumbling. I wouldn't say he's stumbling through life, but, you know, he's running off... off uh, the, the Corellian luck, the gambler's luck, and he, he just keeps winning every time. Yeah, I, I like that. He's way more capable than Han. Uh, what do you think, Jake? Is is uh, is is Card a, a more capable Han Solo? I think so. I think he's a little more focused in what it is that he actually is trying to achieve. I loved the character of Card. Um, he's probably more so than Mara, um, and I like the character of Mara Jade that I would like to kind of see pop back up in canon just because I... I think what Zahn, my yeah. interpretation of the care of the character of card with Zahn was that card was really kind of meant to, to be the character where we as the reader could see ourselves placed into the story. You know, I like this morally great thing, but it's like you play both sides because I, I try to think like, okay, if I was in this universe and was with one of these characters, yeah, I want to be one of the good guys. But at the same time, there's like this survival of the fittest kind of, um, yeah. questioning that you have there and even as the reader you're asking yourself like you know okay if i was in this situation would i 
team up with Zahn or, or Thrawn. I <laughs> see. I just did what you <laughs> it's did. It's gonna happen, man. It's gonna happen. <laughs> would I team up? <laughs> would I team up with Thrawn or would I stay to the good guys? And you know, you know, you don't know. It's easy to say that you would do one thing, but when you're in that situation, you might do something completely different. And I think that that's kind of where Car Card falls is that he's got his moral code but i think his struggle is not necessarily between the good guys and the bad guys but it's how whether or not he's going to break his code or uh, you know follow along with it and you know that's one of those things that i think han solo ended up having that same situation where he had to kind of ask himself am i going to break this code of being a scoundrel am i going to join up with these rebels and fall for the princess um, but I definitely think that Card had his – he had a much more of a focused goal and what he was trying to achieve rather than just running around the galaxy yeah. in a hunk of junk. Jake, you've got such a good point. It, it, it brought something up in my head of, of, you know, like I feel like Talon Card is very good at playing both sides, right? Yeah. And he, he can play both sides and he knows how to play him. But I feel like Han really prefers one side over the other. Mm-hmm. And I think that's – Definitely the, yeah. the difference between the two. Yeah, Jake, I, I think, like that you said yeah. that, um, you know, um, Card is a, a character who would actually fit pretty well into canon. I feel like the closest mm-hmm. thing we've got at this point is Hondo Onaka, who is yeah. totally different and yet totally a similar. <laughs> a little similar. Hondo yeah. has that both sides, too. Hondo has some moments yeah. Yeah, that he, make that his way more of his voice. Ball, though. Way more yeah. Even his ball. voice in, the, in the, uh, the audiobook, I feel like, is very much... Hondo Anaka. Okay, I have to give that another listen. Um, I I do agree Mara. with Cheryl in the chat who says that uh, she doesn't want Mara in canon because she loves her story, um, in in Legends, and and I think mm-hmm. I agree. I actually think that um that Card would be a better next fit into yeah. modern canon from Heir to the Empire than Mara Jade. What do you think, Freddie? Yeah, I think, I think. Uh, I mean, I feel like. Hondo Anaka was Talon Card, and that's sort of my opinion, but I, you know, I don't know. It, it, <laughs> I it, think it, he got that because I think Hondo started out as like this like quasi antagonist for the Clone Wars. And I mean, then he even had the, his own secret base and his own yeah, Kowaki and Monkey Lizard. I didn't, well, I never really thought about it like that. He oh my God. He didn't have, I just started uh, to put all that together. he didn't have Sturm and Drang, but he had, uh, he had his, his yeah. Monkey Lizard. What was that thing's name? Love that thing. I, yeah, I'm I a Legends guy. I don't know. That's the best I yeah. can do. Well, we've talked about these original <laughs> characters. Um, let's also talk about our, our legacy characters. Uh, the only two that we're going to talk about in this episode are Leia and Luke. Leia, uh, of course, gets her own little adventure in this where she is whisked off by Chewie Tukashik and then, it, of course, is ambushed by Kabarak, the Nogri assassin, who she totally just negotiates her way out of... <laughs> you know her own assassination or kidnapping it's unclear um jake how do you think leia makes the most of the whole lady vader situation um i thought it was very leia uh, yeah uh but i that to me is probably where i knocked that point five the no gree i did not i was not a big fan of the no gree in this trilogy did i you like listen to the audiobook or did you read the real thing I listened to the audiobook yeah. in while I was reading with I think the, if you had read Vader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you had read the book your impression would be Yeah. Different. Yeah, that's probably true. And well part of cuz Rook Rebels Rook was so like badass. He's awesome, and, but and, he's he's different and, than this Rook. He's very bit. different. I call him, um, I call him and, Rook. You can call yeah. him. You can say you can use your Georgia accent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean with Leia and bringing uh, the Lady Vader I like that they brought in the Vader aspect because to me that was really a big character develop moment to see kind of Luke and Leia, Leia particularly in regards to Heir to the Empire, kind of come to terms with the fact that she's got to walk around now and people know that she's Darth Vader's daughter. Yeah, um, it's a way to deal really, with that, her legacy. Yeah. And we haven't had that in the new canon stuff outside of Bloodline, and we re- didn't really get to see. It's a completely different type of story. So, I mean, I like that. I think it was very Leia to make the most of that. It kind of reminded me of like dealing with the Ewoks, where she, you know, kind of went along with it for a little bit because she knew that she needed to, yeah, um, to make it happen. Absolutely, yeah. He's really tapped into Return of the Jedi in this movie. He's yeah. tapped into the heart of Return of the Jedi, and you know, uh, Zahn says in. 
his uh, least controversial way possible. You know, when I saw Return of the Jedi, I actually didn't really... And my impression is terrible here. I'll, I'll start over. You know, he said, when I saw Return of the Jedi, I actually wasn't the biggest fan of the Ewoks. Don's got this very distinctive, nerdy voice. Bless his heart. Yeah. Um, he, but he talks about how he didn't love the the, the Ewoks, so he tried to write a, a more a formidable version of the Ewoks. Yeah. And the way to do that is give them knives and bigger teeth. Am I right? <laughs> Uh, Freddie, you want to chime in on this? How does Leia come across in this book? How does she make the most of, um, you know, being approached by the Nogri and then realizing that uh, she's got a way to to make the most of the situation? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. So, I would say my my answer to this has has changed over time. So, as a kid, I was a little disappointed. It was like, oh, this is kind of boring. You know, the political way, the yeah, the you know, the the way that honestly Leia would probably probably go about it especially at that point because she's she's got you know the kids to worry about now which she didn't have to sure. before right and so, that is a criticism of his editor of course you know, how sexist of me to forget her name and i'll see if i can find it but she says you know her biggest criticism rereading this all these years later is she wished they talked more about the pregnancy because there's no moment in a pregnant woman's day that you're not thinking about the lives growing inside yep. of you mm -hmm. and so that's something that that she actually said could have been utilized more do you think that's true i feel like she it should have been referenced a little bit more i mean i love the book as it is uh and and i feel like you forget about it if you don't keep it in mind right like you just for if it's not mentioned you you just kind of go past it and you're like why is she doing it this way and you know as as an adult i read it and i understand she's she's got to think about more than herself and the rebellion, she's got to think about, you know, the kids and the way that she goes about it is probably the best way to do it because she they gain an ally on top of that, right? Yeah. If if that's the purpose, and she doesn't have to kill anybody, you know, and right. she, and everybody's safe in the end, and that's the way she should have gone, and she did, she did do it. So I think the way that she approached it was probably uh, how any any mother with power would yeah. do it. Yeah, I think it really took advantage of her identity as a diplomat rather than just as a Jedi. Mm -hmm. And this is a temptation for some Legends authors. It's like, well, we don't know what to do with Leia. We don't want to write politics, so we're just going to go ahead and make her full-fledged Jedi. And so uh, <laughs> Thrawn does a great job at capturing, um, I think like you were saying a moment ago, the Return of the Jedi Leia, you know, and how she deals with the Ewoks. Uh, but we can't, if we're going to talk about Leia, we've also got to talk about Luke, am I right? Uh, Luke... Of course, in, in a certain way, is the main character of this book. In another way, he isn't. But it's one of the things I love about these post-Return of the Jedi Legends books. You know, yeah. uh, it you, you're going to get a good dose of Luke. And this is best Luke. This is good boy Luke. Um, how do you think, though, it would have been for Luke to go from, you know, saving the galaxy in Return of the Jedi to now, you know, having to take the next step as the galaxy's lone Jedi? You know, where do you go from there, Freddy? How do you go from saving the galaxy? <laughs> what do you do in the sequel? What do you do with Luke in episode seven? This is what we all thought of as episode seven for yeah. you know, 20, 30 years. He he seems, I wouldn't say he seems lost, but he seems like he's he's discovering things for himself now. Uh, you know, the, the Empire's gone. They He doesn't have to focus on Vader and Palpatine anymore. Of course, he he's desperate for... For you know, when he hears uh, Sabayoth, or or as I think I forget what Cheryl called him, Kaboth. Kaboth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're not Freddy. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. So the one thing that I I I just I could sense from him it was kind of he was a little lost trying to figure things out. He was trying to remember his teachings. I feel like that was the thing he was trying to remind himself of. And, you know, you always hear Yoda's voice every once in a while. He's like, fear, you know, fear leads to anger, blah, blah, blah. And, and I feel his, uh, you can really sense Luke's yearning for a master, but he's realizing that this is his moment to to become that person. Yeah, yeah, that's good. He definitely is lost at the beginning of the book. I love the way the graphic novel portrays him. He's just like very reminiscent of, you know, his, his going out moment in um, episode eight. He's just sitting on like a bluff, overlooking the cosmos and he mm -hmm. doesn't really know what to do with himself and he's lost and lonely so there's some good parallelism there and he's kind of like well i, I really you know obi-wan starts off the book by saying uh sorry bro but peace out <laughs> you know i'm out of here um yeah this is clearly too much of a crutch for an author to have you know force ghosts of your jedi masters so zon's like listen 
hey, we've 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 done this for a while, but we're gonna have to break up. Sorry, Luke. We're gonna go on and become <laughs> one with the force for real this time, yo. And yep. so, um, we're kind of left with Luke just sitting on a rock, like, man, I got nobody. And then that's why it's yeah. so tempting when he starts receiving these visions of Sabaoth. He's really tempted to have another Jedi in his life. Do you think that's right, um, Jake? Yeah. I mean, I, I, the lost, the what's next kind of mentality that he's got is just like, what do you, what do I do now? And I think that the way that, why he was so drawn to Sabaoth and even like where, where, you know, part of that lost aspect after that conversation with Ben is that, like he didn't have Yoda, he didn't have Ben. Leia wasn't quite there yet, but I feel like he was walking around part of the story with the idea that like I've got to do this because this is what Jedi do. Like I'm trying to be a Jedi as I know what a Jedi is, um, and I think that that was you know part of his kind of internal struggle and fi- figuring out what's next is because you know he's uh, did it, it ever because he's a Jedi Knight in the Return of the Jedi, and then he's not really considered a master and then it hadn't really got, you know, with the legends lore and things like that, you know, I I know he's, um, the way I've always seen it, he's not a master until he's got students. Yeah. And, and I think in uh, legends, that was the understanding for a long time. Knight meant like, you're going to see some action. You're going to be a fighter and master meant like you're a teacher. It it wasn't so much. You advance from knight to master. Okay. It was like you were one or the other. Yeah. Right. they, They, it's weird because Anakin's right. If we were looking at it, that point of view, they didn't want him to be a master, but it is almost like they, the war forced him to be a master. They didn't really want it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We won't grant you the rank of master. Not going to happen here. Uh, especially <laughs> not near to the empire. No, I like the way you've said that. Yeah. He's not ready to make that transition. He doesn't really know how to yeah. become a Jedi master. And uh, that's why I love that Kevin J. Anderson sees everything that Zahn does in the Thrawn trilogy. And he says, I see your Thrawn trilogy and I raise you an entirely different story that has nothing to do with anything that you wrote. <laughs> in fact, I see your relationship with uh, Lando, excuse me, with Mara and Luke, and I'm just going to have Lando swoop in and steal your girl because <laughs> <laughs> he's absolutely made to do that. And so um, uh, Anderson takes his own version of that, which is Luke needs students. We're going to give Luke some students. We're going to give more super weapons going to have more super weapons and we'll talk about that when we get there uh, before we do we're going to talk about the villains talk about the heroes we're going to move on to the villains perhaps the most perplexing of the villains in this book for me at least i gotta say it reading about him this time around now maybe it's now that i've got kids of my own from a first second read through since i've had kids man sabayoth is creepy um what <laughs> evidence freddie does on give the reader when did you first discover that Sabayoth wasn't quite right? Oh, man. I, when did you know? When was the moment? I would say the second, not the second they met him, but when he took him into that that area, or I forget what it was, like a ruin or something. And he he was just like sneaking ar- around them. You know, just, they didn't know who killed him. And Thrawn obviously had an idea. But I was like, yeah, man, this guy is messed up. <laughs> who, who killed the original uh, protector of the temple? You yeah. mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. No. Yeah, you know, I, I'm just gonna go ahead and put it out there on the record. You can quote me on this. Put this on social media. If an old man, especially a shirtless old man with lots of abs, <laughs> invites you into Buff. his ruins and won't tell you about what <laughs> happened to the dead body that's lying there, that's your sign. All right, run away. Okay, uh, that's a red flag, don't you think, Jake? I'm glad I'm yeah, glad we agree is. on that. By the way, when was yeah. <laughs> when was your moment? I get an amen in the chat. Um, when, did when was your amen. Moment? Um, it was definitely at the beginning, and I think they they even said something. There was a a moment in that introductory where they mentioned the syllable change, the Joris and the Joruus. Yeah, Thrawn um, says, "Notice the the telltale yeah. <laughs> extra yes. vowel in his name, the yes. mispronunciation from." <laughs> and right then, and I and I had a little where I was coming into it so late. I knew, uh, you know, I knew the whole deal with clones. I mean, I knew the whole yeah. post, like just from general spoiled world because it's been so long. Uh, you know, I had an idea that he was going to be off, but as I was reading, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm studying this from the studying it uh from the readers oh, we're studying we're studying for yeah. real i did some i probably did more research on this book for this round table than i did for my actual grad school this week if we're being yeah. honest 
Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that was when I saw that, when they had that little double syllable thing, it was I the was vowel. like, okay, The vowel something's... was the dead giveaway. If it's not the yeah. abs or the ruins or the dead body, it's the extra yeah. vowel. Am I right? Yeah. You know, the offer that eventually seals the deal for Sabiath to work with Thrawn is that he will be given Leia's unborn Jedi twins. Yikes. Am I right? Yeah. What in the I force would... do you think he plans to do with them? I'm going to take a stab at this one, Freddy. Uh, uh, cloning? Using their force powers for something? When in doubt, I don't just know. say cloning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. We just need a freeze but frame it, of that, uh, that look that Jake just gave. Yeah, well, I don't... I, don't, I want to say not clones. Like, I want to say that he's so, like, lost in his own mind that he is this all-powerful Jedi that, I mean, he really thinks that he will start this entirely new Jedi order with, that will, of just these group, these people that will be able to go, around, like, I don't know, some Knights of Ren kind of thing. Yeah, he the wants galaxy. to control them. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to have his um, own empire. He, yeah, I don't, you know, that whole, I have not read Outbound Flight yet to be able to kind of see how a lot of that began, and I don't even know if that does, but it's, like, on my list of, things like the early Sabaoth. But. Yeah, the, the real Sabaoth is a good Jedi, but he's definitely like telltale of the fallen Jedi Order, like the corrupt Jedi yeah. Order, the Jedi Order that's in love with itself and blind to its faults, and he is power hungry, and he is controlling, but the clone, it's basically, it takes all those eccentric and yeah. less than reputable mannerisms and takes it to a 10 or a 12, if we're being honest. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that the... The rationale I think it's going to come up in a later book is that cloning Force users doesn't work well. Um, mm-hmm. At least in Legends, you can't clone Force users because uh, they—it's the Metaclorians, right? You know, they just—they go yeah. crazy. Uh, something does—something doesn't go right. You cannot clone Force users very well, and, and so this is a, a big problem. Is Sabiath's mind is deteriorating over time? Yeah. It makes for a really great. Uh, you know, new villain. You know, how do you write a villain after Darth Vader and Palpatine? Here's what you do: a buff, shirtless, deranged, cloned, deranged <laughs> Jedi Master. Well, I right? think now that you say it like that, that's what I mean. I, I I like that analysis of it. Is that how do you write a new villain? And I think that that's really what kind of needed to happen. Is that okay? Well, so we've been at this point in the story. We didn't have the prequels yet. We didn't have the sequels yet. Um, so all we really know of the Jedi is, you know, Yoda and Luke and it's like, okay, well, what do you do now when you throw a character in there who would seem like it would be Luke's, like someone that Luke would go to for help. But then that person that everything Luke's been told is that the Jedi are good, they're selfless. And then this guy's just a total opposite. Right. And you know, that, you know, that's, I don't know, that's kind of an i didn't think of it that way and it also works well n- narratively that he would be like the protector of this temple that's why he wouldn't be in the original trilogy i think sometimes yeah. shoehorning in extra force users into the eu feels forced. Yeah. and uh, pardon the pun but it actually works with <laughs> sabayoth because first of all he's crazy and who knows what's going on in his mind uh, and second of all he he's he's got his own thing out there on wayland <laughs> protecting this you know the emperor's uh you know um What's the word I'm looking for? Hoarders esque garage. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Thrawn has heard legends of it. And kind of an Indiana Jones esque. We've got to go get the treasure from the temple. The other massive, incredible, original villain that uh, Zahn writes in these books, of course, is none other than Grand Admiral Thrawn himself. Uh, we've compared a little bit in terms of canon versus legends in the chat with Rook and, um, of course, with. Um, you know, whether or not different characters would fit into canon very well. We talked about whether or not we want to see Mara in canon, but there's one character who has been recanonized, and that is Thrawn himself, Mithron Uodo. I mean, I'm sure he would correct me on that, but with my southern accent, that's the way I'm going to say it, okay? <laughs> but here's the thing. In this trilogy, Thrawn never gives us an inside look at Thrawn's thought process. We never hear from Thrawn's point of view. Of course, getting that now in in um, more recent canon books, and it's going well, but in in this trilogy, there's this shroud of mystery around Thrawn, because you're only ever hearing about him from other characters. Pelion, in particular, is our reader stand-in. Um, why do you think Thrawn is so mysterious to readers in these books, Freddy? Yeah, I mean, it. it's so funny, because I, I was, after reading these recently, because it's, it's been a while since I've read them again, but after reading, you know, the newest Thrawn 
uh, books and then, you know, the canon books versus the legend books. I'm just like, oh man, this is, he sounds totally different. And it's because you don't have that inner monologue of what's going on in his head. And it yeah. makes it like, it, it makes it mysterious because they're like, what the heck is he thinking? Imagine you take away all of that inner monologue in the books, right? And then you just see it as is. That's exactly what we're reading. And it's like, man, this guy, he, he's playing chess and we can't see what he's doing because the lights are off, right? Hmm. Where you get that sneak peek in, in uh, the canon. Yeah, and you know, the, the fact that you say, um, you know, we don't see inside his head is one big reason why he's mysterious in, in these books. Um, it, it's it's not just that you know he is um kind of super heroic in these books it's like he has this master plan and it's clearly you know zahn's writing and he's got something that's unrevealed to us as readers and it's been a criticism that people have had of these books is that uh, thrawn seems too powerful but my 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 retort to that is that thrawn ultimately fails at the end of the book um yeah. his mission is unsuccessful so he's not perfect and, uh, you know, the big difference in canon and legends, I-, I think, is this, whether or not we get inside his head, how perfect or how fallible is Thrawn. Um, and the biggest difference in canon and legends is not Lars Mikkelsen's voice, right? <laughs> what, what do you think, uh, Jake? Is it the voice or is it something else? Um, I, I thought that the legend Thrawn was definitely a little more ruthless. Yeah, now, he's, more, oh, yeah he's more villainous. For sure. For sure. Yes. Now, I mean, my... The logic inside of that tells me that, you know, because of Thrawn's introduction in Rebels was a big, uh, because that was more kid focused. Um, and I think, and I'm really glad that Thrawn was recanonized and I thought he was an awesome addition to Rebels. But that is one of those things that makes you think about how much was his character molded to fit that audience, um, which I think was I'm not, not maybe a risk, but. You know, I think that that was something that the the show creators probably had to take into account is that, you know, when these kids grow up and then think, oh, cool, this is another book with the the guy that was in the show that I watched when I was a kid. And they're just like, holy crap, he's, you know, slitting throats and stuff. (laughs) Uh, He only he only slits run throat in the book. And technically it's Rook who does it. Yeah. Right. Well, okay, (laughs) so that he does it through someone. So that that was different. Um, You know, the ruthlessness of it. He you know, I think any time. You know, with his role, he's an alien, and we never see an alien in the Empire. Um, so I think right off the bat, I think that's what kind of adds to the mystery behind him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not only was he not in the original trilogy, considering how important he is, which they addressed that some. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, just the fact that the idea of the other, which, you know, we talk about that in English Yeah, he's class, alien. You know, yeah, which one is the other? Um, but he, you know, he's just the voice, the voice did it, I think in his mannerisms, um, you know, the, the calmness I kind of saw not to use unhinged, unhinged probably isn't the word, but legends Thrawn, I think was probably a little more animated. Whereas I kind of see rebels Thrawn as a little more calculated. Um, but yeah. and when I, I like say that. animated, that's probably not the best word choice considering that the Re- the Rebels Ron literally is animated. But you get what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, I, I think we kind of see a little more emotion from Legends Thrawn. When he's interviewed, um, uh, Zahn talks about how, you know, his his main impetus in creating Thrawn was to have a villain on the one hand who could stand up in Star Wars along with the great legacy of the villains that we had with Darth Vader and... um the Emperor, we needed somebody who would stand out and be unique, and so the number one thing that he tried to accomplish was to show a villain who would rule by loyalty and allegiance. Mm. He would want people to be loyal to him. For yeah. instance, he recruits Pelion to be the captain of his Star Destroyer because Pelion was the uh, the Imperial who ultimately made the call at Endor to leave the battle. He's going to mm-hmm. retreat the rest of the fleet, realizing that they lost, whereas other Imperials were just going to keep fighting to the death. Ron wanted somebody who was smart. And, and we do talk about the fact that he is more ruthless in this book, but, uh, Freddie, how successful do you think Zahn is in you know, showing us a different type of villain, a villain who's trying to lead by uh, loyalty? It's not just yeah. about art with Thrawn, in other words. <laughs> that, that's not his only thing. No, it's not, but it's definitely a meme. Yeah, but uh, you could see Thrawn is a very capable leader. There's no doubt about that. It, it, 
and I see it's interesting because the the Canon Thrawn seems more tactile, more strategic, and he's benefiting himself and his people, right? Whereas this one, you don't really get that that uh, I guess uh, trait of him, right? He he's mm-hmm. just a really ruthless, uh, in it for the Empire kind of guy. And uh, personally, I think. I think this Ultron, it's he's kind of scary because he's too smart and, and he's he is ruthless, right? So if he happens to catch you right in the middle uh, of something, he will slit your throat. He's not he's not worried to do that. Yeah. That's the kind of Thrawn that this is. And I, I personally, I like this Thrawn. He's, he's mysterious and he's scary as heck to me. Well, that's going on the list of how would you like to die in Legends? You know, would you <laughs> rather be in, in teched into a battle droid for all eternity, frozen into a, you know... <laughs> A cave put, uh, with with Darth Bane's with allies, or uh, have you know be assassinated by an ogre? I will ask you this one. You know, we're talking about Thrawn. Jake, what do you think? You know, if Thrawn were to watch all of your Utini YouTube videos, or if he were to look at your Star Wars collection, what would Thrawn be able to tell about you from your art? Let me he know, talk. everybody in the chat. Think about this. <laughs> he talks a lot. <laughs> but there is an order to the way that he talks. Notice at the top that he starts <laughs> in chronological order, and he's very orderly. There's no dust, but there's just so much content. I don't know that I can take it all in at the same time. <laughs> that's how I. That's how. That's how Thrawn's going to take give in. Everybody give a hand yeah, for that one good. on the spot. Uh, that one wasn't uh, even in the show notes. He had no prep, no warning <laughs> for that one. I, I like Rebels Thrawn, but I know you didn't ask me that, but I, that's how I see it. So that's how I kind of imagine him walking in and looking at things and being like, it's a lot to take in. Right. You're giving me a lot at one time. I, I find Rebels Thrawn to be uh, very consistent with the Thrawn trilogy Thrawn. And I yes, I call mm-hmm. this the Thrawn trilogy. I'm going to call the new book something else. That's fine. We can say the canon Thrawn trilogy. We can call it the Thrawn Ascendancy trilogy. But this is the Thrawn trilogy, and I will die on this hill. <laughs> Except for, please, I don't want to die. There's more Thrawn books coming out. Um, you know, I find the Rebels Thrawn to be very consistent. I found Zahn's canon Thrawn in his books less consistent. So <laughs> it's it's all a yeah. mess. Um, one thing's for sure. These are great. So, uh, Freddie, yeah. what would Thrawn learn about you from your art? Uh, this guy likes Star Wars Galaxies way too much. <laughs> and he talks about Trusa Bakura any opportunity he can. Just leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, he would probably tell me that, uh, you know, for somebody who likes to collect Star Wars art, you think he could actually frame some of these posters. Uh, because, you know, you got the humidity and you got the windows open sometimes. Sometimes they're falling off the walls. You know, he would tell me, like, you know, you might think that you're a collector, but, you know, get serious about it. Please. Come on. This this stuff belongs in a museum. Um, let us know what you think. What would Thrawn learn about you from your collection? Uh, we've had a ton of fun talking about all of this on this episode. Uh, I do want to give one last character-centric shout-out. Any any other characters you want to um, make sure gets a word on the podcast, guys? There's so many well, other well, characters well. we haven't talked about. <laughs> what's, what's that, Freddie? I'm glad you talked about me. <laughs> Lando, baby. What do we yeah. have here? I love that guy. <laughs> what do we have here? <laughs> That's who yeah. I was going to say. Uh-oh. We're going to have a Lando off. Only one of you Lando can off. say Lando. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, Lando has a great role in this. I like that we've got Thrawn, um, Han. You got Han and Zahn and Thrawn. Come on, this is confusing. Winter. Don't forget Winter. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, sw- I thought Winter was going to go bad. I thought Winter was the mole. <laughs> yeah, we don't know who the spy is in this book. Yeah, There's always right. a spy in the you're Legends right. books. There's always a spy. We don't know who or what it is. Uh, I hate it, Failure. Yeah, hate Failure. Failure. Failure's a great character that you love to hate. Winter is coming, Joxie. You're right. She says says winter is coming. Um, and so uh, we will, of course, talk about uh, winter once we get there. We'll talk more about Phalia in the future books. The other character I do want to give a shout out to is the Wookiee with the speech impediment, Ralra. Oh, God. <laughs> we got to give a shout out to Ralra. Um, of course, once Leia gets to Kashyyyk, she didn't bring C-3PO. Doesn't have it. Or did she bring C-3PO? I don't know. No, remember. she couldn't. That was, He was playing her. Okay. Yeah. Couldn't bring C-3PO. And um, so she didn't have, you know, a great way to be able to understand Shiri Wook. So Thrawn writes in a a Wookiee who has a convenient speech impediment that allows 
<laughs> for him to be able to to converse with Leia. He can speak English, even though it's rough and growly. It's terrible. And the other in the book, it doesn't come across all that bad in the printed text. But I've got to say, in the audio book, oh my gosh, yeah, <laughs> this is some peak legends. And don't worry, everybody, I have a clip. Oh, I present to you the sound of Rora. Narrated by Mark Thompson in 2011 in the Heir to the Empire Anniversary Edition. Here we go. Get ready for this, everybody. Prepare your earbuds. Curving from shoulder to waist across their brown fur. The taller of the two, his baldric composed of gold-threaded tan, took a step forward as Leia headed down the ramp. She continued toward him, using all the calming Jedi techniques she knew praying that this wouldn't be as awkward as she was very much afraid it would be. Chewbacca was hard enough for her to understand, and he'd been living out among humans for decades. A native Wookiee, speaking a native dialect, was likely to be totally incomprehensible. The tall Wookiee bowed his head slightly and opened his mouth. Leia braced herself. Mm. I to you, Leia Organa Solo, Bring greetings. I, Tororuko, welcome you. Leia felt her jaw drop in astonishment. Uh, oh, yeah. thank you, she managed. I'm, uh, honored to be here. <laughs> As me, by your presence, are honored. <laughs> he growled politely. I am raw, Rachin. You may find it easier to call me Rora. I'm honored to meet you. <laughs> my, my, my name is Rora, but you might find it easier to call me Rora. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So good. And uh. that does it for this week on Legends Look Back. Everybody, thank you for joining us. This has really been a wild ride from our rocky start with the tech there, of course, all the way up until now. Uh, we are glad that you have stuck it out with us. Uh, let us know what you think in uh, the Utini Legends Look Back Discord. Uh, let us know your questions if you want them included on next week's episode where we're going to get into the overarching questions. We're going to talk about my favorite Legends quote of all time. Just wait for it. Uh, we're going to talk about why Ben Kenobi had to go. We're going to talk about the Ysalamari as a storytelling shortcut. We're going to talk about hot chocolate, the frequent use of Star Wars tropes, uh, Thrawn's battle tactics, all kinds of awesome stuff. 